So, so I'll be reading from verse 15 to 23. And in the church Bible is in page 1182. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones of powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to him all things, and to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the, on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you only in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the oak held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Deji. Please keep Colossians 1, verse 15, page 1182, open in front of you. Let me pray. Lord God, our request is simple. Please show us. Jesus, in all his glory. Amen. Uh, as you saw in the video, um, we've just been to Jordan. Uh, I promise I won't spend lots of the next few weeks just talking about Jordan. Uh, but I do have one or two illustrations today, so let me get them out of my system, uh, and then we can all move on. One of the places we visited whilst we were in Jordan was a place called Wadi Rum. It's a huge uh, desert plain, uh, vast miles and miles of sand and rock and heat and uninterrupted sun. Uh, it struck me uh, as we were being driven across it that I wouldn't have a clue how to get across this thing on my own, and I think I'd probably be dead within a day. Thankfully, I didn't have to. We had a guide, someone who knew what they were doing, someone who knew where they were going, and somebody who cared about getting us safely to the right place, at least until we'd paid them the money. But we could have confidence in that person because we trusted them. We, we knew the person we were following. The Christian life is often referred to as a journey through the wilderness. Paul is writing this letter to a young church at Colossae, a, a church facing pressures that came with trusting and following Jesus. And he wants to give them confidence in the person they are trusting in. It's not a, it's not a, a, a religious belief system. It, it's a person that they are to trust in and follow in. Chapter 2, verse 6, he says, just then as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. He wants them to stay rooted, built up, strengthened in Jesus. He wants them, verse 23 of our reading today, to continue in their faith, established and firm, not moving out from the hope held out to them in the gospel. And to help the Colossians with this, Paul is now going to remind them who the Jesus is that they're trusting in. Who the Jesus is that they need to stay rooted in. Now, last week I was watching one of the uh, semi-finals of the, the Premiership Rugby. You don't need to know anything about it except to know that it was an amazing game. It was fast-flowing. And after one team had scored this, this amazing try, the commentator says, you know, sometimes you don't need a commentator. And that's what I feel like about this passage. Uh, one Bible teacher describes it as the most majestic description of Jesus found in Paul's writings. And so I was just tempted to stand up here, read verses 15 to 23, and say no comment. 
And some of you are thinking, that's a great idea. (laughs) So without trying to add or get in the way of this incredible description of Jesus, I hope what we're going to be able to do, what I'm going to help us to do, is to let our hearts and minds dwell in the glory of Jesus. So that, as per Paul's desire, our roots might be strengthened in him as we see more and more of the one that we are in. Amen? So, two simple headings. The first, verses 15 to 20, who is Jesus? And then the second, verses 20 to 23, who Jesus makes us. Who is Jesus? Quite simply, he is the one who is supreme over all things. Listen to that description again. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. How does Jesus have the supremacy? Why should Jesus have the supremacy? Well, verse 15, because he is the image of the invisible God. God is spirit, so he cannot be seen. And according to John in the introduction into his gospel, he says, no one has ever seen God. In the Old Testament, Moses asks to see God, and, and, and God says to him, no one can see me and live. And what Moses gets to see is sort of the tail end of God's glory as he disappears around the, around the mountainside. Isaiah sees a vision of God. But, but that's not God himself. Even the Israelites, as they move about from place to place, and God is with them, he is shrouded in fire and in smoke. No one has ever seen God. But then John says, chapter 1, verse 18 of his gospel, the one and only Son who is himself God and in the closest relationship with the Father has made him known. How? Well, Paul tells us here in verse 19. Because God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Because Colossians 2 verse 9, In Christ all the fullness of God lives in bodily form. Last Jordan reference for today, I think. One of the places we went to was the place they think Jesus drove uh, legion out of the man and into the pigs, and they, and they ran off down the cliff. If you, don't, if you don't know the story, Matthew 8, it's amazing. But it suddenly struck me as I was walking there along this very old Roman road, God has walked on this road, because Jesus has walked on this road. It's an incredible reality, isn't it? God walked on a road because Jesus walked on a road. Jesus makes the invisible God visible. Because God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. All of God's glory, all of God's power, all of God's wisdom, all of God's grace, all of God's authority, all of God's majesty, all of God's holiness, all of God's steadfast love, all of it. Fully dwelling in, on display in, fully revealed in, seen in, Jesus, the man who is God. You want to know God? Maybe you're here this morning and you're someone who says, well, I'd like to believe in God, but I just thought, if only he would show himself. If only he would make it clear who he is. Maybe you've got friends who say that. Do you know if you have someone say that, what do you say? If they say to you, oh, I just wish God would show himself or let me know he was there or show me what he's like, you can say, he has. He has. Jesus says it of himself. 
His followers say to him at one point, well, uh, would you show us the Father? And he looks at them and he says, really? That's my uh, modern interpretation. He says, don't you know me? How can you say, show us the Father? But basically he's really saying, really? I've been with you this long and you still don't see it. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Because Jesus is God. Jesus is supreme because he makes the invisible God visible. And he's supreme because he is the firstborn over all creation. Now it's important we understand what Paul means when he says that, because it can throw us off. Some break away in false branches of Christianity, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, but it includes many other cults as well. They latch on to that, what Paul says there, and they say, See, Jesus isn't God, he's just the first thing that God created. Very amazing, very important, but not God, just the first thing God created. And if we know they think that, and we read this, we might get wobbly. We might go, oh, are they right? Because that kind of sounds right, doesn't it? It kind of sounds like he was the first created thing. He's the firstborn. But that is not what Paul means. First of all, it can't be what Paul means because it makes no sense of what we've just said. It makes no sense of the context. We've just seen in verse 19, in chapter 2, verse 9, that all the fullness of God, all the fullness of deity is on display in Jesus, through Jesus. We're talking here about a divine being, God, as Jesus. But also, as we'll see in a minute, he says that all things were created by Jesus. All things. If Jesus is created, then not all things can be created through him, right? You see what I mean? Paul would have to say 99.99% of things were created by Jesus, but there's just this, this small thing, very significant thing, but a small thing that wasn't created by Jesus, Jesus himself. So it can't be all things. Yet he says all things were created by Jesus. So it makes no sense of what Paul goes on to say if we say Jesus was just created, he's not God. But also it makes no sense of how the Bible uses the term firstborn. Israel is described as God's firstborn. Well, they're not the first nation that God created. They're not even the most important nation in the world when they were formed. But they are the people that God chooses and elevates to that position. They are the first primary special exalted nation. And then Psalm 89, it's talking about the Messiah, the, the promised king that God said he would send. And it says, verse 27 of Psalm 89, I will appoint him to be my firstborn, the most exalted of my kings on the earth. Can you see? They're appointed. They're raised up. It's not something they inherit. It's not something that comes because they happen to be the one that was born first in the family. No, the king is appointed to be the primary one, to be the supreme one, to be the exalted one. This is not about chronology. The firstborn is about position, about status. He is appointed to be the most exalted, which is why Jesus has the supremacy. He's not the firstborn of all creation. He's the firstborn over all creation. He has been appointed to have supremacy over everything. And he's also supreme over everything because he created everything. Verse 16, in him all things were created. And just to make it clear that Paul means all things, when he says all things, he lists it off. He says he created all things in heaven, he created all things on earth, he created all things that are visible, he created all things that are invisible. That's not just the things that you can't see because they're too small or they're too far away. The things you can only see with a, a microscope or a telescope. No, he's talking about the things you can't see because they are in a different dimension. He's talking about heaven. 
And he's talking about the beings that inhabit heaven. Jesus made them all. The angels. Every power and being in heaven. Heaven itself created by Jesus for Jesus. Even the fallen angels. Even Satan himself created and under the authority of Jesus. He is supreme over everything. And every throne. And every office of power in this world and beyond it, created by Jesus and for Jesus. The President of the United States, the President of Russia, the Prime Minister of India, the President of South Africa, the local council leaders, your boss, your head teacher, every office of power created by Jesus... And the person that inhabits that office does so because Jesus has decided they will and they will inhabit it for the glory of Jesus. Do you get that? Not only was that authority created by Jesus, but the person who holds that authority will use it for Jesus. And you go, are you crazy? You think... The Prime Minister of India, who's persecuting Christians, inhabits that office for the glory of Jesus. Have you looked at the world? Listen, they might not serve him knowingly. They might not serve him willingly. But in some mysterious way... They will serve the purposes of Jesus as they hold that office. And they will go on no longer and they will go no further than he determines. So whatever the outcome of July the 4th and whoever ends up being prime minister, and let's be honest, even if you voted for them, you're not going to be singing and dancing with excitement on that day, are you? Whatever happens in the years that follow... Have confidence, have peace, because Jesus has and always will have the supremacy. Amen? Amen. Hold on to that truth, brothers and sisters, because it's going to be a rough ride. Keep this vision of the supreme Jesus in your minds. Keep your heart rooted in him. And keep remembering it's all for him. All things serve Jesus. All things are there to ultimately glorify Jesus. Everything finds its real purpose in Jesus, including us. Your real purpose in life is to glorify Jesus. That's why you were made. That's why you were saved. It includes our salvation that we're going to go on and see in a minute. But, you know, too often we end up making ourselves the end part of God's purpose. The the kind of center of it all. It's about us. Yes, God loves me. God saved me. God wanted me. I am the most important thing to God. Now, yes, God made you. Yes, God saved you. Yes, you are deeply loved by God. All his heart is poured out towards you in Jesus. But ultimately, it's for him. It's for his glory. It's all for Jesus. All things, everything serves his glory. So keep ourselves out the spotlight. Don't put ourselves in the center. Don't put anybody else in the center. Don't make ourselves the end. Instead... Elevate Jesus. It's where he belongs. Anything and everything. He is before it. He is behind it. He is above it. He is beyond it. All things created by him and for him. All things, verse 17, sustained by him. He holds it all together. What keeps the earth in place the right distance from the sun? What keeps it spinning around? Is it gravity? Is it centrifugal force or centripetal force? Ultimately, it's Jesus. 
I was listening to a podcast the other day and somebody had written in and said, what's the point in algebra? Some of you have taken maths uh, exams this week. Maybe you're thinking, what's the point in algebra? Uh, and some of you can't remember what algebra is. It's where you've got like letters that represent numbers or values and you've got to do some very complicated things to work out what it all was. I never understood the point in algebra. I'm not sure I ever understood algebra, actually. But... <laughs> But the, what is the point? And, and the podcast host responded with Colossians 1, 17. What's the point in algebra? He is before all things, and all things in him all things hold together. You see, maths is important for understanding all sorts of things. And when Isaac Newton understood the law of gravity, and Isaac Newton was someone who loved a bit of algebra, do you know what he said? He said it just gave him an increased admiration for God that he created the world in such a way, that it has such beauty, but also that it has such order, that it has such predictability. Algebra demonstrates the order of the universe. It reminds us that the universe works, that it still works because Jesus is supreme, holding it all together. Now, I know you won't get extra marks on your mass paper if you put that. But if you really understand that truth, then you know more about how the universe works than the best astrophysicist and certainly more than your mass teacher. And Jesus is supreme, verse 18, because he is the head of the church. We, we saw earlier, didn't we, that that is one of the pictures the New Testament uses uh, about the church, is that it is the body of Jesus and he is the head. He is the authority in the church. He is the head. He is the boss. He is the supreme authority. He is above and before any pastor, any elder, any deacon, and he's even before any member and any of your preferences, no matter how long you've held them and no matter how dear you think they are. He is the head. He has the supremacy. And it is our privilege to live under that rule and authority. And we better make sure we are always living under his authority. And it is our delight to praise him as the supreme authority. And as people come in here and they mix with us, they better look and go, huh, Jesus is certainly in charge here. But it also means that the church has absolutely everything it needs in Jesus. Everything it could possibly need because he is supremely sufficient. In him all things hold together and that includes Elmstead Baptist Church. We are dependent on him for everything including the very life that runs through this body. I heard someone say this week, a body with two heads is a monster. A body with no head is dead. He is the firstborn from among the dead. It's a reference to his resurrection. Jesus is supreme. He is the firstborn because he is even supreme over death. We saw verse 15, he's the firstborn over over all creation. But now we see here, he is the firstborn over the new creation. He is the firstborn over the redeemed nation, the new birth, the new life that comes as we are united to Jesus, comes from and is only made possible by his resurrection. And whilst Jesus is alive, so his church will be full of life if it stays united to the head as it stays rooted in him. And you know, he really is. He really is supreme over all things. Paul has just shown us that with this this incredibly majestic description. And the Colossians, they needed to know it. They're they're a young church. The Christian faith at this point that Paul is writing to them is maybe 30 years old. They don't don't have all the books and they don't have all the confessions and they don't have all that history. They They are just working it out 30 years after the events of that first Easter. And some people see them 
as this over-enthusiastic but insignificant kind of offshoot of Judaism. Some people see them as a dangerous heresy that need to be quashed. But many people just, they, they're a bit confused. Well, sorry, what are you? And they're trying to work out this faith in a culture that is full of the hip and trendy Greek philosophies. And then they've got the Greek and Roman gods. And as you read through the New Testament, particularly the book of Acts, you see the massive influence that 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 religion, the Greek and Roman gods, how that dominated life in their communities. And then that's if they've got to wrestle with all of that before you then add in somebody coming and going, ah, yes, but this Jewish tradition is very important. So these guys are under huge pressure to shift and to compromise and to add and to include and to integrate some or all of that stuff. To to integrate it into their faith in Jesus. And Paul is saying, no, don't be intimidated. Don't be knocked off. Don't be shaky. Don't compromise. Don't fear. Don't be persuaded. Don't go all inclusive. Jesus is supreme. He really is. I know you find it hard to believe it sometimes as you, as you go about life. We feel, it, we feel that, don't we? We're, we're surrounded by the hip and trendy philosophies that dominate our culture and worldviews. Welcome to Pride Month, everyone. Religious traditions, suspicions, pressure to conform, pressure to affirm, pressure to mix true faith with all sorts of other bits. And be honest, it chips away at you, doesn't it? It's great here this morning, Thursday morning, not feeling so, oh, come on. Wouldn't it just be easier if we just conceded a bit, included a bit of that, in, included a bit of this? Can't, can't we just do a bit with them and a bit with them? And Why do we have to be so exclusive? Can't we be a little bit more inclusive and it the world seems so much bigger doesn't it and it feels bigger than Jesus more powerful and we feel outnumbered and outmuscled brothers sisters it doesn't matter what the world has doesn't matter how many finances it has, how much muscle it has, how much influence it has, how much airtime it has, how many followers or allies or numbers, what positions they hold, what endorsements they receive, what qualifications they have, what accolades they receive. Christ is bigger. Christ is stronger. Christ is over it. Christ is using it for his purposes, for his glory. Christ is supreme. He really is. Stay rooted in him. Keep that view of Jesus. He really is. But is he? Is he? It's always worth reflecting. When you're you're faced with the glory of Jesus, when you're faced with his supremacy, when you're confronted with his authority... Is he really supreme in me? Some of you, some of you have seen all sorts of things this week that you think are great. We have uh, the European football championships coming up. People are going to be lauded as great. They're going to be celebrated. They're going to be worshipped. And there will be things in your life that you think are great. You are giving yourself to stuff that you think is the most important thing. If I don't do this, if I don't get this, if I don't go there, if I don't put this into here. And you're going to read something like this. You have just been confronted with the supremacy of Jesus and for some of you, You're going to go home, and it's like it's made no difference at all. Interesting. Oh, I'll I'll add that in. Christ must have the supremacy. 
One of the things that flows from, from this, as Paul will outline in chapter 3, is that we have to put to death our former self. We have to put to death our former life and instead live as the people of light, live as the people of Jesus. Are we doing that? In your life, in your decisions, in your priorities, in your responses to things, in your activities, in your relationships, does Christ have the supremacy? He should do. Look at who he is. But look at what he does with his supremacy. How does he use his supremacy? Verse 20, he uses his supreme authority and position to reconcile all things to himself by shedding his own blood on the cross. Did you get that? How would any human, any human you know, how would you yourself, given this much authority and this much status, how might you choose to use that the supreme divine Jesus, the one who is supreme over everything, he chooses to use that power and that position to reconcile all things to himself by shedding his own blood on the cross. Dwell on the glory of that grace for a moment. Through him to reconcile himself to all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. We've seen who Jesus is. Now see what Jesus chooses to make us. First, verse 21, by seeing who we are or who we were before Jesus. Who are we without Jesus? We are people alienated from God. We're, we're people in a foreign kingdom. He described it earlier, didn't he, in verse, in verse 12 it's the, and 13 of the kingdom of darkness. And the kingdom of darkness is at war with the kingdom of Jesus. So we're not just foreigners in a different land. We're enemies. Alienated and so separated. Separated from all that God is. All that God has revealed to us in Jesus. All the fullness of his grace and all the fullness of his love and care, all that commitment, all that goodness, all that holiness, we're alienated from it. We're separated from it. And so we are, as Paul explains, as he says something similar to the Ephesians, he says we are without God and we are without hope in this world. I asked if Jesus is supreme for you. Do you recognize him as the supreme God? As the God described in these verses. If you don't see him as that and your life bears no resemblance to that. Then, that is, then you, are, you are alienated from God. You are separated from God. And you are without hope in this world. And you will be without hope in the life to come. Why are we that? What's made us that? Do you know I was this? This is the state we're all in outside of Jesus. What makes us that? It's because we are enemies in our mind. And you don't, maybe you sat here this morning, you've come in, you thought, whoa, who's this guy? I'm not an enemy of God. I mean, I'm not particularly for him, but I wouldn't say I was against him. And now you've come in here telling me I'm some sort of dead person alienated from God and I'm an enemy of God. Listen. Jesus is supreme. It's not enough just to like him. It's not enough just to accept him. He must have the supremacy, not just a part of you, but all of you. You need to acknowledge him as the supreme one. He must have supremacy over you. He must be the first and no one else. And as you begin to press in on the reality of what that means for people, there is where the hostility comes. Everybody's fine believing in nice Jesus until you start saying to them, no, no, he is supreme and this is what it means for your life and this is what it means for your relationships and this is what it means for your priorities and this is what it means for how you spend your time or your money. This is what it means for how you conduct your family life. They start to go hostile. Try it. Come and speak to me. I'll make you hostile really quick. 
Go and, go and speak to people out there and begin to press in on the reality of their lives and you will see the hostility. If Jesus does not hold the supremacy in your heart and mind, then you are hostile. And that hostility, says Paul, leads to evil behavior. The position of your heart towards Jesus leads us to behaviors that are in opposition to Jesus. Listen to how Paul describes it in chapter 3 and verse 5, where he says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. This is the, this is the hostility This is the evil behavior. He lists them. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Rid yourselves, verse 8, of such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do you recognize yourself in any of that? I see some of me there. Why is it in a world that is apparently so connected, can people feel so isolated? Why is it in every community that we may inhabit, whether that's your neighborhood, whether it's this suburb of London, whether it's London itself, whether it's your school community, whether it's your social community, why is there always loneliness and fear, and suspicion, and poverty, and illness, and aggression. Why is it broken? And we will find all sorts of things to blame. And we'll identify all sorts of reasons. There's no shortage of expert commentators to give political theories, or psychological reasons, or sociological reasons, or historical reasons why those things are the way they are. And at times like this, it's always the governing party's fault, isn't it? It's always that lot. They've been in for 14 years. They've not fixed it yet. And yet, I, don't get me wrong, they share some of the blame in all of this. But the answer that the Bible gives for the reason that things are like the way they are is because the communities are full of people like me. People who are hostile in their mind towards God that leads them to all sorts of evil behavior, and so they're alienated from God, and they feel alienated from one another. And you can listen. You're going to listen to debates on the TV. There was one the other night, and they come up with all sorts of suggestions, don't they? Kick that lot out and put us in power. Throw more money at it. Revamp the system again. Stop immigration. That'll fix it. Change the law. That'll deal with it. And maybe some of those things, some of those things might soften some of the impact of the problem. They never deal with the problem themselves because the problem is with our own hearts. And the only thing that can solve the problem of our hearts is the radical grace of this supreme Jesus. The one who sheds his own blood on the cross to reconcile us to God to make peace between us and God, to make peace in our own hearts and to make peace with one another and who changes us to be something entirely different. Did you see what Jesus makes us? Verse 22. But now he has reconciled you to Christ's physical body on the cross through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. That's what you are. If you trust in Jesus, you are holy, without blemish, and free from accusation. Paul is looking ahead to the day when we're all going to stand before Jesus, and every person will stand before Jesus, and every person that has trusted in Jesus, that has trusted in his death and resurrection, they will stand before God holy. That means with the purity of Jesus and the goodness of Jesus. They'll stand without tarnish, without stain, without spot, no defect, without blemish, no corruption. And they will stand there without accusation. On that day, if you've stood in Jesus, as you stand before Jesus, nobody will be able to shout from the sidelines, what do you think you're doing there? You've got no right to stand there. Who do you think you are to stand there? 
Satan can, can't accuse you. Your own sin can't accuse you. No other person can accuse you. Not even you can accuse yourself. Not because of who you are. We've just seen who we are. No, we can stand there because who Jesus has made you. And in the same way we really do need to believe that Jesus is supreme, you really do need to believe that this is what he's made you. There are a few things that break my heart most in pastoral ministry. The first is when you see people doing what Paul has said that they shouldn't do, which is they drift away from Jesus. They become unrooted and they move away from Jesus. It breaks your heart. But the other thing that breaks your heart is when you hear people say, well, I've stayed away from church or I've stayed away from fellowship with other believers because I feel guilty, because I feel ashamed, because I don't feel good enough, because I don't think I'm as good as everyone else. It breaks my heart. Now, maybe you, there's an awareness there of sin and the guilt and the brokenness. And yes, that needs to be acknowledged and repented of, but... I, you need to believe that if you're trusting in Jesus, then you never need to stay away from church, and you never need to stay away from Christians, and you never need to stay away from God himself. Because of Jesus' blood, he has made you holy. You are without blemish or stain. You are free from accusation. Please believe it in your heart. I've done it. You don't want to pray because you fear the gaze of God upon you. A bit like, you know, when you didn't want to talk to your mum and dad because you knew you were in trouble. You don't want to open your Bible because it's like a mirror reflecting all your imperfections. No, believe that if you trust in Jesus, he has shed his blood at Calvary and you really are holy without blemish, and free from accusation. I don't know, as you look at the week, as you look at your life, and you, you, you think of a world, that there was that bad decision, there was that opportunity missed, there was that relationship tarnished. I don't know I can, if I can stand before God, believe that it is all dealt with. You can stand in Jesus. That's not presumption. That's the glorious confidence that the gospel gives. If, if we stay rooted in him. I need to finish. But this is the key. We can only have this confidence. We can only know this reconciliation. If we stay trusting and rooted in Jesus and the good news about him. The Colossians, as you look through chapter 2, the, Paul fears they're going to be tempted away. They're going to add something into or onto their faith in Christ. Some Jewish tradition, some Roman religious practice, uh, something they feel they have to do to clean themselves up before God. Or, or maybe they're going to add in some new philosophy, a bit of Jesus with some self-help, a, a bit of Jesus with some psychological well-being or whatever else you dream up. It's something to make you feel better about yourself. Paul says, no, all you need is Christ. And I don't know where you're going to be tempted to shift away from Jesus. Where you're going to be tempted to add something else on to Jesus. Paul says no. All you need is Christ. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. Amen.